In 1825, the Stockton and Darlington Railway was opened. It was the first public railway to use steam locomotives and was very much the brainchild of George Stevenson. The line's first locomotive was named Locomotion, the most advanced locomotive of its day. Nevertheless, within a few years, George and his son Robert would build an engine that would make it look laughably primitive. The Stockton and Darlington wasn't much of a railway by modern standards. It was single track. Many of its trains were still horse-drawn. It had no stations, signals or timetables. If two trains met head-on, as they often did, they would have to negotiate which one had right of way, possibly with the driver's fists. Despite this, the railway was considered a great success, and proved that this railway lark was more than just a flash in the pan. And in the northwest, they were taking notice. The cotton industry in Manchester was booming, but if they were going to keep up with the emerging American cotton industry, they'd need an upgrade to local transportation. The roads were dismal, and the canals had an effective monopoly on traffic from Manchester to the port at Liverpool. A railway seemed to be the solution, and the engineer William James was an enthusiastic advocate. George Stevenson was appointed engineer over James. Then he was sacked when it turned out his route didn't make much sense. Then he was hired again to build the railway according to a new route. Not everyone was happy with George's appointment. In fact, one surprising conflict came from young Robert Stevenson. William James was a friend and mentor to Robert. After George was appointed, James' career went into a decline from which it never recovered. James believed he had properly been done over something rotten. At least one biographer has suggested that this was a contributing factor to Robert moving to South America in 1824, but no one knows for sure. Fellow engineers John and George Rennie and surveyor Charles Vignoles were also done out of a job and left under a cloud. Whether you consider George Stevenson's appointment to have been fair or duplicitous, the new railway was an achievement. Stevenson and his assistants built tunnels and cuttings and even managed to float a line over Chat Moss, a local bog considered an insurmountable obstacle. It was the first double-track main line, the first to incorporate signals, and, importantly the first to be entirely powered by steam. At this time, while locomotives were nothing new, there were concerns about their ability to run a reliable mainline service. Locomotion had suffered a boiler explosion in 1828, and the general consensus was that engines that break down and or kill everyone are a bad idea. George Stevenson was still one of the top steam experts, but other engineers were catching up. So the management of the Liverpool and Manchester announced a competition, the Rainhill Trials, to find the best machine for the job. The engineering world was all of a flutter and ideas poured forth from all over the world. Locomotives powered by vacuum, by hydrogen, by mercury, even by perpetual motion were suggested. But in the end, there were only four serious competitors. When we last saw Robert Stevenson, he was in Columbia. Having bailed Richard Trevithick out, encountered a bunch of shipwrecked sailors and survived a storm at sea, he came back to Britain. He hadn't made his fortune, but he could safely say that he was now his own man. He and George were now engineering partners, exchanging ideas and constructive criticism freely. They built a locomotive named Lancashire Witch, a dramatic improvement on even their best work up to that point. In fact, it was so good that the Liverpool and Manchester Railway's think tank considered it to be an unrepeatable fluke. The Stevensons disagreed and set to work on a locomotive that was then known as the Premium Engine. The premium engine was a leap forward in locomotive design. The most important innovation was a multi-tube boiler. The tubes in a locomotive's boiler are much like the heating element in an electric kettle. Previous locomotives only used one tube running from the fire through the boiler barrel and out through the chimney. Engineers Henry Booth and Mark Seguin had independently suggested what seems obvious in retrospect. Surely multiple tubes 
could multiply the amount of steam produced. The Stevensons were willing to give it a go. The boiler was partnered with a blast pipe, a new invention by Timothy Hackworth that allowed the engine's chimney to effectively suck air through the boiler, making the fire burn brighter and conducting hot air more efficiently. In human terms, the engine could breathe more easily. Unlike most engines of the day, the premium engine would incorporate diagonal cylinders to make it smoother riding. Finally, the engine had to look good. Robert had the whole thing painted bright yellow, a dynamic and bold choice for a clean, efficient, fast engine. As the engine left the works, it gained the name by which the world would come to know it, the Rocket. The competitors for the trial were announced, and the public all agreed there was a clear favourite. The colourful, futuristic engine they called Novelty.